guys, welcome to this episode of the Garage Gym Podcast. Today, I'm on with Greg Chin here. He is the owner of a gym in Ontario called Just Lift, and he's had a whole lot of experience coaching some of Canada's best weightlifters. So, Greg, do you want to just start us off with a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, as, as Alex mentioned, I'm the owner and head coach of Just Lift. Uh, we're based out of Ottawa, Ontario. We've been open since 2012. I've been involved in weightlifting for about 11 or 12 years now, um, but in a coaching capacity for eight. And I've been a Team Canada coach now for about two years. My first international competition was uh, Pan Ams in 2018, and I've been making it out with the team for almost every international competition since. Cool. Yeah, that's a pretty good experience. I mean, like any time that you can travel internationally with a team is awesome, and that's going to be a oh, good yeah. experience. And then is that – just traveling with your own lifters or are you traveling with just all the team Canada members? So I've only gone to competitions where I've had at least one athlete. Um, yep. and that, that's a policy thing as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the way it typically works is that, um, you know, there's usually four, three or four of us there, um, depending on the size of the meet. And even though we all have our own athletes, um, you know, generally speaking, a lot of the athletes that will be on these teams can't travel with their individual coaches. So what ends up happening is we, we almost always all work together. Yeah. yeah so that makes a lot of sense. Cause I know like we're a very large country with a lot mm -hmm. of space in between our big cities. So it's not mm -hmm. always feasible for everyone to go with their own coach because you might have 10 different athletes from across the second largest country in the world. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it kind of makes more sense to just send, you know, one or two coaches to yeah. everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what is that like working with athletes that you've never met before just at an international competition? Because it must be fairly, I don't know, stressful for them because they're there without their normal coach, right? Yeah, it can definitely be a, a stressful experience. Um, I remember my, my very first world, um, and I've, and I've kind of kept this up since then, but I remember thinking when I got there, like, I don't know any of these people really. Um, you know, I know my athlete, but that's about it. So I made a real effort when I got there at Turkmenistan to immediately introduce myself and to basically ask the athlete stuff like, you know, we're used to in coaching. Like, what do you need from me? What do you want? And um, yeah, yeah, it was, it was very nerve wracking because especially at that level, um, there are so many individual peculiarities that matter that you need to account for. Um, and even when it came to divvying up coaching duties, for instance, like um, I'm not the kind of coach that like really gets into smacking people around and stomp around and screaming and shouting. Like I'm not, I'm not like your, your, your mutant testosterone field coach. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that works for some people that works for a lot of people, but it also doesn't work for many people too. Like it's um, some people find it very distracting. So it's, it's really important in that respect to kind of mold your coaching style to the needs of the athlete. So, in that respect, yeah, it can be quite stressful because you, number one, you have to read the athlete. You got to figure out, you know, who they are and what they need from you. But the other thing is that it could be a coaching style that you need to deploy. That's completely, you know, the opposite of what you're used to. Like I have had athletes who I've worked with in international competition that'll tell me like, I need you to smack me at this time. Like hit me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, uh, how hard, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah. That could be tough. And then it could be tough too, in the sense that you might have sessions back to back and you have to switch personas essentially. Oh yeah. And that's kind of where it's good to, you know, have that conversation with the athlete beforehand where you can build that preliminary relationship and just understand what they need. Because like, if you're not the only coach there, if there's three or four coaches with the team, then it might be good to say, okay, well, this is what my coaching persona is and I'm going to fit best with these three athletes. And then you can kind of divvy it up that way. Yeah. And it, it really, it all comes down to like, I think this is the thing that a lot of people don't necessarily realize about international competition is that um, it's incredibly difficult, if not like next to impossible, to just beat your best. Um, the big challenge of international competitions is adapting. Really. It's, it's adapting to different conditions in competition. It's adapting to, you know, um, a completely different pace of competition. It's adapting to the food. It's adapting to the travel. It's adapting to like people you don't know to, that you have to work with. It's, it's a lot of shit. There's, Many, many aspects that way are very challenging. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's something that I think especially applies to Canadian weightlifting in specific, because say you lift in Romania 
and you're mm-hmm. going to European Championships, that's not very far, right? But any yeah. national competition you're going to from Canada is probably on another continent, right? So that's a lot. Yeah. Of, that's a lot of culture shock. That's a lot of things to adapt to, as opposed to if you're used to lifting in Europe or Asia, where everything's just you know a train ride. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it is, and you know what? Um, I I've yet to see one Canadian athlete at their first international competition and you know coaches included in here too um that doesn't look like a deer in the headlights when it comes to the first session yeah you know yeah, um, everything at international competitions just so much bigger than Canadian weightlifting oh yeah I mean so one of the athletes I coach that isn't Canadian um her name's Anna Van Bellingham she's uh, an 81 out of Belgium and um for her it was a very different experience with the international circuit in the sense that it was, um, it was staged. So for her, she got good at lifting within Belgium and then she got good at lifting for France. And then she also lifted for Germany. So there's all these, like these regions nearby where you can kind of like take a laddered approach to your competition. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so it's, it's a lot easier to see, and experience, you know, uh, gradients of competitive depth in the European or even the Asian systems, just because of that proximity, as you mentioned. Whereas, yeah, for us, it's like you do nationals, and then your next big meet is Pan Ams. Yeah, which is on another continent, usually. Exactly. It's yeah. and there's so much to adapt to. Yeah, because like for us, say, because I'm in Alberta, I could drive 12 hours to the Okanagan to do Ogopogo. Mm-hmm. Whereas that's the next closest big city to me. And that's still like a relatively local level competition. Whereas, yeah, if you're in Belgium, you can drive two hours and you're in another country and then it's international. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the interesting thing is that um, it, it's not like, like this is kind of tangential, but I think a lot of people have this, this presumption that um, most of the European countries are just better at weightlifting than we are. Um, and that their lifters on average are just better. And that actually isn't the case. Um, you know, when I look at the numbers of a lot of the clubs, around Europe, um, actually we tend to seem stronger, but it's because they, they have those opportunities, I think, where they can really develop someone systematically and the ease and convenience in which they can get those experiences is sort of what drives them that way. And what produces that difference, at least when it comes to international competition, whereas in Canada, there's, there's so many competition gaps. Like if you did a regional meet in Western Canada, um, you might find that, you know, a club meet or a local meet in Quebec is actually more difficult, that it's more competitive. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know? Um, and so it can be very hard to, to root your experiences in say with, you know, the status you presumed the competitions you've coached at in Canada with like the actual competition you're going to face. Yeah. Cause it sounds like in Europe, everything's actually more of a competition, right? You're actually going back and forth with other mm-hmm. lifters of a similar, similar caliber at competitions. Whereas say in Western Canada, if you're, you know, one of the top five lifters in the province, like you're just following yourself every competition. Yeah. And, th- and that's definitely the case. Um, and that can be really hard for coaches. Actually, one of, um, one of my mentors, Daniel Robitaille, um, he was telling me that some of his first international competitions, he didn't know what to do because when he was in Canada, you know, I don't want to like come off as being arrogant here, but he was just too damn good. Yeah. His lifts were always following himself. He had no idea like what it meant to have to go back into the warm up and do a couple lifts to stay warm. He had no idea how to like really count attempts um, at the time, you know, um, thinking about all these different possible outcomes because he just, he always knew where he'd be. Yeah. When he, when he knew where his athletes would be. Um, but once he said, do you remember you telling me that once he got to that, that, that level where he was, you know, really deep in the mix at worlds, that's when the, the game completely changed and it like, he had to really kind of look at his strategies and, and adjust. Yeah. Cause as soon as there's any sort of like level of competition where you're going back and forth, there's so much more strategy that goes into it. Cause it's not just like, okay, take my first attempt, go up, mm-hmm. go close, take my second and so on. Right. You have to count the attempts between you and the next person. You have to mm-hmm. take into account they're probably going to low ball and then change their attempt and then play around. And it just becomes a game more so than just lifting weights. Oh, yeah. And you know what? The thing that's interesting about, you know, weightlifting in each nation is that, um, you know, I think we have this 
we can get a sense when we look at training systems that there's, there's almost always sort of a cultural flavor to them as well. You know, um, when we look at the Soviet system or the Chinese systems and we see how organized they are and we think, oh, we, we need a system like that in North America, you know, I know what comes to my mind is I think like that's just not possible because those are like very much top down command control countries. Right. So that kind of system makes sense. So anyway, where, where I'm going with this is to say that beyond, you know, kind of the basic rules and, and expectations or, or things you'd see in weightlifting. Um, there are a lot of kind of team individual team uh, strategies that you'll have to manage as well. Like for instance, um, I know team Germany will almost always take the attempts they say they're going to take. That's just how they play. They go with what's reliable. They go with um, what they know they can do. Team China will almost always um, put an attempt on the board that is either absurdly high relative to what they actually do or absurdly low. And they do that just to throw you off because they'll, they'll make a change that's like 15 kilos. Yeah. And suddenly yeah. you thought you had three attempts and now you don't. Um, you know, likewise, some of the, um, a trick I noticed at World in 2018 that some of the African nations were doing was, and this was in the women's session, was they would put a change plate on the inside of the bar and then the primary disc on the outside. So say I saw, you know, a pair of 20s in the bar. Well, if I'm just scanning the room and I'm like, oh, okay, she's at 55. No, she's not. She's actually at 60 because they have two and a half on the inside. I just didn't notice them. That's um, super weird. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. They do all kinds of stuff like that. So the, the things that you'd expect in Canada um, as a coach, the kind of the way the game is played here, you, you won't necessarily see that with other, with other nations. Um, likewise, some nations like uh, I know, I'm struggling to think of any off the top of my head, but um, it's more like coaches or lifters I know that, like, and you see this in Canada too, is that they'll go for broke. Like they will only go for attempts that are, are extremely close to their maxes. Mm -hmm. you know? And a lot, of the, a lot of the Eastern European countries will do that, the ones that are more uh, like influenced by, say, like the Bulgarian system. Yeah. Um, so it's, you have to take into account, like, okay, these are the possibilities, but then these are also the likelihoods when you're coaching internationally. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's also an opportunity for you as a coach to try and look at all of those other systems, get some exposure to that and say, okay, which ideas do I like? Which don't I like? How do I want to incorporate this and how do I want to learn from it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest things I learned from international competition is how important it is to really kind of treat, um, the warm up as, as a real field of play. Um, in the sense that, you know, when we do these international meets, typically there's usually minimum two or three, minimum two coaches, usually three. And if it's a competitive session, usually the way we'll, we'll divvy up the duties is one of us is with the athlete. One of us is, you know, watching the board and making calls. And another one of us is literally just walking around the room and taking stock of who's where, because at an international level competition, you know, you're all, you're all jockeying for position and the, the difference of a kilo is, is what you're fighting for. Yeah. So, you know, usually you're in the mix with some other groups of countries. So you're, you're always kind of keeping tabs then on who's, who's where you're always looking for that advantage. Um, and I find that domestically, you just, you, you typically don't find that kind of depth. Yeah. Yeah. That's the big, I don't want to say problem, but that's just the thing in Canada is there's not that depth of lifters. Yeah. We only have, you know, 35 million people or yeah, 35 million people. Yeah. yeah. So there's not a huge population here. And of that we have maybe, I don't know, a thousand lifters spread across the second biggest country. Yeah, we, we have like a, a few, yeah, around there. Um, and yeah, and our talent levels are all over the place because we don't necessarily have an established system, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas you look at a place like China where they have like well over a million registered athletes and they have an incredibly robust and well-funded system. And yeah. then you look yeah. at their nationals and it's like, oh, the top 10 in any given weight class could actually win worlds. Yeah. Yeah, and then if you win Chinese nationals, you're like, okay, I win worlds now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas much, yeah. Canada, what we get is like, oh, you competed in a varsity sport. You played hockey till you were 22. And then yeah. you give up on that. Okay, you're going to try CrossFit for a month. And then maybe you find your way into weightlifting. It's yeah. rare that we get people that actually start from a young age and like go through what the proper long-term process is to be a good weightlifter. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? Even, even like, you know, finding – dedicated weightlifting coaches that can work with someone for that long. Yeah. It's tough here. You know, as I'm sure, you know, like, you, cause you're in the same position as me, like being a weightlifting coach in this part of the world is labor of love. Oh yeah. Cause you're, you're not making a lot of money. That's for no, sure. You're struggling. 
right? <laughs> and if you can, I like, if you can stick with being poor for 15 years and stay with an athlete and keep them interested for that long, you know, you can still produce a world level athlete, but there's just so many more financial hurdles that you have to go through along the way. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. As a coach in North America, I've literally had times where I've gone on a piece of paper and I've been like, okay, these are the pros and the cons of you know, developing a person <laughs> as far as my finances go. Or like, these are the pros and the cons of going in a performance direction rather than like a, a more recreational direction. Yeah, exactly. And I'm at the same point where I'm doing that with my education too. Cause I'm like, well, do I want to keep working or mm -hmm. do I want to go back to school so I can learn how to do this better? But then I'm going to be poor and mm -hmm. that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you also have all these other sports in Canada that are professional that are trying to pull away all your top weightlifters. Yep. Like for example, my best weightlifter right now, Max, he's mm -hmm. 17, he's 125 kilos. And he has an offer to every school in the country and a bunch of schools in the States for football because oh, yeah. he's huge. And that's where the money is, right? There's yeah. no million dollar prize in Canada for being an awesome weightlifter, even though he could easily walk over the entirety of the competition in the country. Yeah. Yeah. It's so you got to find that athlete that's got, you know, the heart that has the, just the raw physical talent and then has the situation and then beyond that, you have to have that person also be okay to say like, yes, I willingly choose the possibility of an Olympic medal over millions of dollars potentially. Yeah. And that is <laughs> such a struggle to balance as a coach <laughs> and even as an athlete. Yeah. If I were in the same position, I'd be like, okay, I can play football, which is, you know, a fun sport, make lots mm -hmm. of money, or I can make no money and do this thing that's even harder and mm -hmm. less rewarding. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a really tough decision, no matter what yeah. you're on. Now I will say that there, there is a bit of a solution to that. Um, the, something that's really interesting to see is, you know, like American weightlifting has gained a lot of traction recently and it's, it's not a coincidence. Like one of the things they've been doing that's, that we don't do that. Um, I remember talking to Phil Andrews and some of the, uh, the other USAW guys about was that they very intentionally will go to universities and they'll go to high schools and they will look for what they call transitional athletes. So an athlete who, say, played college ball, yeah. but just wasn't quite good enough to get picked for an NFL team or a CFL team, yeah. but has a lot of, like, potentially has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, room to grow as a weightlifter. Yeah. Or, you know, for instance, even, like, um, take women's athletics, for instance. How many, how many like, re, like, women's sports do you know of that can, like, pay the bills after university? Zero. Exactly. Yeah. So for, like, a lot of uh, women gymnasts who are like, well, now what do I do? I still want to be an athlete. Weightlifting is a great avenue. Yeah, uh, leaders like there's tons of uh, power athletes like volleyball. Yeah, um, where they don't necessarily have athletic avenues to go to after university. So, weightlifting is a uh, is a is a prime uh, prime opportunity for them. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're kind of failing as weightlifting coaches in Canada is all of the winter sport coaches are actively doing that. If you look at bobsleigh and skeleton, they'll go pick up basketball and volleyball athletes out of college and say, "Hey, I need a power sport athlete for this." Mm -hmm and you can get all this carding money and you can train at mm -hmm. this facility, right? That's government funded, but we don't have any of that for weightlifting. Yeah. Right? And that's like, should be our job as independent weightlifting coaches is to go out and do that. Oh yeah. Oh, I agree. And you know what, but this is the thing is it's, it's just tough. It's hard work. Oh, yeah. I think weightlifting in Canada is very much like a, a startup. <laughs> you have kind of some key stakeholders. Uh, there's a vision. And then, you know what, there's no point in coming up with like specific committees or departments yet because everyone's got to do the different job. And like, I think in Canada, for instance, like we're still, we're still looking for that model. We're still testing hypotheses as to what will work and what won't work. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of what, uh, what Phil Andrews and the USAW did in like, the last five years, how they've really turned around is that they just were like, okay, this is the state of weightlifting in the United States and it's just not working. Hmm. let's just let's test ideas let's listen to the uh, lifters let's listen to coaches and let's get after it that way um i will say canada is now a, at a point where we're now very much in that same position that usaw was five years ago we're, we're now in a position where you know um the board's changing a lot of the expectations are changing and we're now in a position where um we can start exploring those things but the real challenge for us is initially is going to be that we all have to wear so many different hats. We all have so many different jobs to do and yeah. we're going to be stretched real thin. And when you don't have that kind of ability to like really just stay on one track, like say a bobsled coach can, um, it's very easy for things to get lost in the mix for, you know, uh, 
lapses in communication to occur and for, you know, like just life to get in the way. Mm -hmm. Um, but by that same token, I will say that we're getting it done, but yeah. changes are happening. So, yeah, cause I can't really speak for where you are in Ontario, but I know definitely in Alberta, we've been running the exact same system for like 50 years and yeah. nothing has changed. And it's getting to the point where, you know, that system worked 30 years ago when Alberta had more lifters and more gyms, but it's been declining. And with that yeah. system still running the way it is, it's only going to continue to decline because when you have so many gaps in competition and you only have two competitions a year that first time lifters can go to, and then you go to that competition and everyone's just following themselves, right? Because nobody mm -hmm. wants to change the structure of mm -hmm. how the tournament goes then nobody wants to weightlift. Oh yeah. I, you know what? Like I can think back to 10, 12 years ago when I first got involved in this and I remember everyone just complaining saying, Oh, we don't have enough money. If, if the government gave us millions of dollars, we could do this. We could do that. Quite frankly, we would have pissed it all away. Yeah. It there. wouldn't work because the, the model just the model that was so pervasive until very recently even. Um, and is, it's still present. It's, it's been obsolete for 20, 30 years now. Yeah. It just hasn't worked. Yeah. And it's just a matter of, you know, getting fresh blood in there or fresh ideas and mm -hmm. trying to change things and just experiment with those hypotheses. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, again, going back to the Americans, you know, we, so if I think back to when I was first starting as a weightlifting coach or as a weightlifter, I remember the talk at the time was, oh, Canada, North America, like we're no good because we don't have a Soviet situation or we don't have a China situation or we don't have a Bulgaria situation. We don't have a system. We don't have a a government apparatus that gives us like unlimited funding and whatever resources we need. And we presume that that was the gap, that that was what we were missing. But if you look at say the OTC in the United States, um, when that was operating, that was, that was similar to what they were trying to do when they had like yeah. Agamir there and they had uh, Zygmunt there. Um, they tried to do it and quite frankly, it just wasn't effective. And I'll tell you why it wasn't effective was because they didn't have the resources to do it properly. So Zygmunt was literally responsible for coaching like 20, 25 people, writing personal programs for everyone, tracking everyone. You just, you can't do that. Not at that level. Um, and then moreover, the way kind of the position American weightlifting was, was that, you know, people would just make the team or get to the OTC and in their minds are like, okay, that's it. I'm done. Because don't forget too, at the time, you know, the, the presumption in North American weightlifting was that, oh, the sport is just completely like every athlete's just um, sweating drugs, sweating anabolics. We're not. Yeah. So we have to hope winning anyways. So to a lot of people, the, the, the zenith of their career was just making it to the OTC. Um, and obviously that wasn't effective because now if you look at the landscape in the United States, it's all about individual coaches. Nobody trains together. Yeah. Um, a lot of these athletes train in a garage at home or training like, at a, like with a coach from like in another state even. Yeah. Just does this. Um, and it's produced remarkable results. Like had Tokyo happened this year, um, we projected anywhere from four to six medals being won by the Americans. Yeah. Cause if you look at Kate and I, like she just trains out of her garage. Mm -hmm. Her and her coach have a great relationship and they work with each other and they found a sustainable model to make it work. Right. Yep. And it's working for them. Yeah. Yeah. And then if I think the only really good example I can think of out of the States where people train as a team is at Cal strength. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thing is like, um, you know, the, the team training situation, like it just, I think we all had a, a different idea as to what we thought it would do and what yeah. it actually did. You know, um, the fact that people are at a distance and they can't necessarily see what they're all doing is it gives a great incentive to like really push yourself because you're not there in training with say, you know, um, whoever, like, you know, Kate and Maddie aren't training together. Like they're, they only see each other on Instagram or social media or they hear what other people see, but it's not, it's not the same. It's not like, you know, you just don't have that same level of, uh, of observation and of, of even just building a, a relationship with someone else. Yeah. It's, it's much more like it falls under, well, really like what everyone else deals with with social media is you make all these presumptions, you fill in the blanks yourself. You presume yeah. like, Oh, they posted this, they must be doing this or they must have that. And you don't actually know that you're just inferring from what you see on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's that, if you're actually training with someone, like you're sharing a bar, if you're just not as intrinsically motivated, you have that person sharing the bar with you saying, okay, I'm done my set. <laughs> you got to go. Right. 
Whereas yeah. when you're training alone, it's kind of easy to just fall into that mundanity of, okay, I finished my set. I'm going to scroll Instagram. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would even dare go so far as to say that, you know, we have a much more individualistic culture in this part of the world. So I think just the notion that, you know, one coach, one athlete, or like one coach to two high level athletes, I think that even just plays into, into how the, the, the rather the quality of the coach athlete relationship in this context, like no. people here are used to more individual um, interaction and they expect more of it too. So I think, you know, the team model just, it would stretch coaches too thin Hmm. And it, it would just, it wouldn't have worked here anyways. So I think what we have going now is, is what's going to produce results. Yeah. But then again, at the same time, that goes back to what we were talking about earlier is yeah. Okay. One coach, two high level athletes. How do you make that work financially? Yeah. Well, that's the challenge for us, right? Yeah. Cause you can't yeah. just charge two athletes out the ass and make a full-time salary off of two people that are training full-time. That I know. Moms. I know. And that's so, and this is kind of like, this is something I've felt about weightlifting for a long time now in Canada is that, you know, going back to the whole funding question, it's like to get more funding, we have to do better, but how are we supposed to do better if we don't have any resources? Yeah. It's chicken and the egg. It's like, yeah. How, how do we get there? Do we just, yeah. you know, be poor until there's enough people that are good that we get money? Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately it really is just kind of like this, it's a, rough free market model. It's like, okay, unless you can prove to the population that there's value in this, that there's value in like watching this and pain, watch it. And like, you know, getting money in there, getting demand there, you know, tough shit. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yep. Yeah. So that, I guess that's where we definitely need to try and look at transitional athletes too. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, if you look at, again, at Cal strength, like that's how they found West kits. Mm-hmm. Is- Rob Blackwell went out to a university and he saw Wes kids lifting and he calls up Dave Spitz. He's like, yo, we need to get this guy in the gym. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like one of these USAW will do is they'll literally go to like a university graduation or they'll, they'll just even set up like a high school, uh, like a meet and do like, okay, let's do max power clean and like max bench press. Just anything that's like kind of tangentially related to lifting and, and Olympic yeah. lifting and just to get people excited. Yeah. And you know what? It works. Yeah. And as long as like you have the coach there and like two people from the team that are really strong and everyone else th- that comes in to do it just looks at them and they're like, wow, those people are strong. I want to be like, yeah. This. And then you just kind of yeah, get yeah. related. Yeah. Something else they've done that's really great that I, I would like to start doing in Canada is um, getting more involved in universities. So one of the nice things that UCW does is that um, they, they deliver training services to university strength coaches. Um, so by the time you're ready to kind of roll out a kind of sort of transitional program, well, you also know that, you know, if you've done this for the last four years, that uh, a collegiate athlete is going to have some experience with the Olympic lifts because it's yeah. just part of the program. And so is that USA weightlifting working with those college coaches yeah. and like teaching them how to teach the lifts? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I know I've definitely run into like in my college athletics career, some strength coaches that are like, okay, here's your prescription for today. You have this many power cleans from position two or whatever. Yeah. And then you go do it and you're like, how the hell do I do this? And then they yep. look at you and they just have no idea how to teach it. And it's like, why are you prescribing something that you don't know how to teach in the first place? Yeah. Oh yeah. And like, you're not even going to know if that's your depth of knowledge, you're not even really going to know where to put it in the program. Yeah, exactly. Cause that's definitely something I've kind of run into in my college career. Cause I wasn't just an athlete in college to learn whatever, right. I was there to learn strength and conditioning. So I kind of would pick apart the model as I was going through it. And I would see these strength and conditioning coaches that are very well read, very educated. Yeah. They know their stuff. But then when it came to the hands-on coaching and actually how to teach the lifts and how to implement everything in a practical sense, there was mm-hmm. that huge gap of knowledge. Yeah. Oh yeah. And in our field, that's, that's one of the problems, right? Is there's, there is like a chasm between what the science says and what coaches actually experience. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll give you an interesting example of that. Uh, so I went to a seminar years ago with Vladimir Safnov. Um, as a coach, like I would probably say I'm the most influenced by, by the rough Russian methodology. And that's simply because it was designed to be versatile. Yeah. Um, and I remember asking, cause like I had read every Russian text published by Bud Charnia and like Sporting Me Press. I'd like, I, you know, dogged those texts. I have so many notes. I created all kinds of spreadsheets and tested things. And I remember asking all these questions about the, these things. And he was like, wait, what are you talking about? I was like, oh yeah, you know, like the, the, uh, 
uh, Ari Romanov is the training of a weightlifter. Like in this, on this page, it says that you need to do this and this and this. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, I heard of that book. I never read it though. Um, so here's what you need to know about the Russian training methodology. He's okay, I'm listening. He says, all right, I'm going to give you a question. Would you rather have brain surgery done by someone who performs brain surgery every day or by a guy who teaches brain surgery in school and doesn't do operations, doesn't do surgeries? I was like, well, I picked the guy who actually practices. Right. So that's the thing is most weightlifting coaches in Russia, we don't know that stuff. Yeah. What we do is like it's informed by it, um, but it's not the method we use. We don't take out spreadsheets and calculate, okay, 25% of our volume this week. 30% this week and then 18% the next week. And then we're going to make sure that 25% of the program is snatching. And then, you know, like they don't do that. Um, if you audited a program against the, the kind of the, the, the guidelines set forth by these texts, then yeah, they, they sort of adhere to it, but not really. Yeah. Cause you want to look at all of those statistics and all of those, all those, whatever, like you just want to use those as guidelines. It doesn't need to be, yeah. Okay, 25% per, like, percent of the program is snatch. Oh, but their snatch is poor, so we'll take that up to 27%. It's just like, okay, you should have a chunk of your training be this and a chunk be that and a chunk be that. And if your athlete is really strong and really slow, you should probably give them lighter weights work on speed. If your yep. athlete's really fast, but you know they can't clean as much as they can power clean, okay, you should probably make them squat more. And it's just yeah. sort of general guidelines that you want to take from a lot of that Russian me methodology. And again, that's something that I'll see too, is with the Canadian NCCP level one, which is basically based on precisely those Russian texts. If that's all the education a lot of coaches will have, then that's just exactly what they'll stick to. They'll just look at that book and they're like, okay, I need to write my spreadsheet. I need to have this much volume this week and this much volume this week spread out over these exercises because that's what the book said. Yeah. And, and you know, as well as I do that when you actually you know, when you institute a program and you start working through it with an athlete, that's just not how it works. Yeah. You're constantly making changes. You're constantly adjusting. Yeah. And especially cause like, I know in the training of the weightlifter, they're like, okay, we got to have 35% of our volume mm -hmm. of the week on day one. And we got to have 35% of the volume of the month on week one. So then yeah. day one of the program comes 12% of the volume of the entire month. And then you give that to an athlete and they're like, Hey, I need to go to physio now because I'm dead. Yeah. Or let's say you wrote a six week progression like that and you, you got really into like how many of your, how many reps you're going to do with this exercise, how many, this intensity, you know, how many variations you're going to do. You could plan say six weeks. You could spend like, you know, a weekend doing that. And by the way, I've done this. <laughs> then your athlete gets injured three days in, gets injured on the Wednesday of week one. And your everything you just did is, is now not useful at all. Yeah. And that's the, and that's kind of the problem is that when you, when you oh. adhere to these, these strictures of programming, um, it's like I was talking about before. It's a program is just a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis of the training process. It's what you think you need to do that will produce the outcome you're looking for. Yeah. But, you know, as we've talked before previously, right? Like when you actually go to do it, you're going to make adjustments all the time. Yeah. Because a program is really just like a lesson plan, right? It's okay. This is our objective. What do we do to get to that objective? Yeah. Well, that's thing. You, you can plan a progression and, and what does it, what does it matter if, if the athlete, so let's say you presumed, okay, next week we're going to be able to add five kilos to this and then you do it and the athlete can't do it. Oh, well now what? My whole progression is gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then that's kind of one of the things I always like to say about programming is like a program is only as good as the context that it's written for. Yep. And if you look at the context that those Russian textbooks are written in is okay. It's 1972. The press was just abolished. Mm -hmm. we have this theoretical model as to how we should come towards training now that there's no press in competition. And we're going to look at the training of all of our lifters that were successful through our system. Yeah. So that's a system of you're picking athletes from a young age to be the best. And then you're looking at the outliers of that group that actually became successful. And now if we apply that to a Canadian lifter that probably didn't start weightlifting until they were 18 or 19, they're not an outlier that's on drugs that's been training since they were. Yes. Five. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like just again, like programming, um, take Prilipin's table, for example, you know, that's kind of like our gospel for figuring out, okay, how much work should I make someone do at a given intensity? Yeah. And that was derived basically by, uh, Prilipin literally going through hundreds of training journals of athletes and being like, Oh, 
good at the, good athletes seem to do volume like this. I'm just going to say that this is then roughly that what you should do. Yeah. You know, that's like, it's how the RDAs for vitamins were established. Um, you know, Harvard medical school in the fifties ran a survey basically of people that they thought looked healthy, you know, and then we're like, Oh, well, these are your blood levels of vitamins and we're going to average these and you're going to say that this is how much you should get. Yeah. That's, so I feel like in training, the training world, especially, we're always operating off very dubious data. Yeah. And that's where, again, you can kind of just look at that data as, okay, these are guidelines. Mm -hmm. We should use that as a starting point and then deviate based on what we see with our eyes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So let's move on to the hot topic that's on everybody's mind this week, yes. is the McLaren report. So Thomas Ian just resigned from his presidency at the IWF and McLaren was commissioned to write a report about what recommendations should be taken to try and fix the, like the bureaucracy at the IWF. Mm -hmm. okay. So I've just got a few little excerpts from that report that were recommendations made by McLaren for how to fix the IWF. So number one here is that Board members should be suspended from the board if their national federation is sanctioned for doping violations. Okay, because that's one interesting thing that would happen with uh, with Ian when he was president is like a lot of people that were on the board were from the countries that popped the most. Mm -hmm. The vice president was from Thailand, and Thailand had to pull out of the last World Championships, which they were hosting. Because yep. many of their athletes were on drugs. Yeah, it's uh, it's a rough problem, and it's 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 very it's so obvious. So I'll give you an example. Like at the Las Vegas Open last year, um, during the technical meeting, there was actually a delegate. I'm not going to mention which nation they're from. Yeah. But this person was like, "Hey, I think that we should get advance notices to when our athletes are going to be tested. I'm okay with like the Roby Point system, and I'm okay with uh, you know the increased." frequency testing, but I, I think we ought to be told when, when it's going to happen. And like half the room, half the delegates, they were looking like, it's like, this guy's serious. Entire purpose. Um, no, <laughs> like, <laughs> but that, that is, that, that is kind of the mentality. Um, and yeah, so that, that is a problem. And there has been problems, there have been problems in the past where, you know, you, you basically have these alliances then because you have certain nations that dope who have, obvious interest in continuing it and then you have others that obviously don't so yeah it is a big problem yeah and i think if the if the iwf is actually serious about you know um changing its image and ensuring that athletes compete without the use of uh, anabolic aids that they they need to be consistent on that yeah but then where that kind of runs into an issue is that the board members would kind of have say over whether or not their athletes would get popped because a lot of testing data would come in saying, okay, this athlete tested positive, and then it would just never get published, or it would get published six months later saying, okay, they've been retroactively banned from six months before we published mm -hmm. this, so that they can still go to the Olympics. Yeah. So I hope I don't like kill my career saying this, but <laughs> um, if you've ever watched House of Cards, um, that's how weightlifting operated for the last 30 years. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it's all just backroom dealing, back channeling and, and these little individual alliances. And then, yeah. Yeah. And basically any myth that anyone's ever heard about doping and weightlifting, like this report basically just says, yep, no, anything you've ever heard is true. All yep. of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it was, it's pretty bad. And um, honestly, it's, you know, having been a lot of these international competitions, like I can totally see how that would happen. Yeah. Um, like just, John himself, I always found whenever he would address the community, he was always very, always very careful with his words in the sense that, you know, he, he'd, he'd be famous for making these press releases or comments that sounded like, okay, he's listening, but he's also making a warning to people, you know, hey, don't cross me. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely a guy who knew how to use his words because his career was a lawyer, right? Yes. So he, he knew how to get around the law. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is the, it was very much run like a, like a mafia basically at the top. Yeah. You know? Which, you know, unfortunately is more common than you would think in high level sports because yeah. 
that's basically the exact same way the International Wrestling Federation is run. Because okay. when wrestling was threatened to be taken out of the Olympics, basically what happened that we, I've heard about from behind closed doors is the Russian mafia was like, you know what, we're taking over the Federation now because we don't want to see this taken out of the Olympics. Mm -hmm. The Russian mafia was like, okay, just hand it over to us. We'll take care of it. Right. Yeah. So very yeah. similar to the situation going on with Diane. But I think if they can actually implement that, that will keep everyone a little more accountable since their positions are going to be at stake if they don't adhere to what the rules are going to be. Oh, absolutely. So as, you know, as much doom and gloom as there is in the McLaren report, um, it's a good thing. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I remember having this, this discussion with uh, Tom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher his name here, Tom Gagubna. He's a Belgian coach. Um, this guy's been involved in weightlifting like, like he – He's forgotten more than I know, probably. Um, and he was one of the one of the people like really involved in uh, create like uh, architecting the Roby Point system. Um, but we were talking about this that like it's going to get much worse before it gets better. That you know, in order to really make a change, we first have to expose all of the uh, the nonsense going on behind the scenes, yeah. and that's ha been happening in the last two years, uh, the last even the last five, where you're getting so many more positive tests coming out, and you know, people actually being meaningfully sanctioned for it. Yeah. And that's kind of just going to bring it to the forefront of everyone's mind is, oh my God, there's so much drugs in this. Mm -hmm. but yeah, you're right. That is the first step in cleaning it up is figuring out what we need to actually clean up. Yeah. No. And you know what, this is a, this is a big moment too for Canadian and, and, and really, I don't want to just say Canadian or North American. It's like really, it's a big moment for, for any, any nation that has in earnest tried to complete or to compete clean. Yeah, definitely. Because when I started, you know, the, the, the pervasive attitude was like, oh, man, if I could just get, like, top 10. <laughs> top 10 clean, that would be yeah. great. Um, because it was just presumed that you could not win. If you didn't use drugs, you, you can't win. Um, and, and unfortunately, in our sport, you know, drugs work really, really well. Like, if you look at the literature, there's a, there's a roughly 10% difference in the performance outcomes of someone who's on versus off. Yeah. And then when you look at, like, you know, the top 10 versus the top one, or the top, the tenth versus the first position. It's actually about a ten percent spread. Yeah, because it's it's not a sport like soccer or basketball where there's you know there's technique and strategy and multiple team members. Mm -hmm. It's just you and a physical object you have to move. Oh, like it was stunning seeing um, Team Kazakhstan the last two worlds. I remember watching them when I was a younger coach. I remember watching Ilya Ilin all the way through like the, you know the twenty twelve Olympics and yeah him doing his thing up until 2015 or so and then just like watching what he was like later yeah um like watching our world this past year seeing him struggle to clean and jerk something he used to be able to snatch it was like it's unbelievable yeah and that just makes it so obvious where it's like okay either this guy had just an insane injury that nobody talked about or he just stopped taking drugs yeah okay well drugs. i remember um in the clean and jerk session of world or of uh of worlds in 2018 I was with, uh, with Mo Charon, and I remember remarking to her after the session completed, I was like, hey, you just, you just out clean and jerked the Olympic gold medalist. Like the Kazakh, like yeah. you, you beat her legitimately. Like that's insane. Like I remember, yeah. I remember like that, that one experience in my mind, I was like, wow, like this, this is crazy. Like, so we really do have a fighting chance. That one moment I was like, it just galvanized me because it, it just immediately made evident to, me, evident to me that, you know, actually, yes, we can win. Yeah. Um, you know, even if you look at a, a competitive division like like the 96s, um, look at how Bodie's doing compared to them now. Oh, yeah. Bodie's doing insanely well. Yeah. Like, and I remember thinking when I watched that kid start, I remember watching that kid at Junior Provincials in like 20, 2010 or 2011. I remember, like, I, obviously, I, I knew who the St. Abbey's were, but I had no idea that um, he'd be able to compete as, as effectively as he is now. Now, yeah. That I don't say that to take credit away from him. anything. It shows what a phenomenal athlete he is and how hard yeah. he's worked. But to have that that landscape now, where it's like, yeah, this kid could actually win, yeah. it's huge. Oh yeah, and that'd be huge for Canada itself. Yeah, right. Because if everyone is taken out of his way, that's not clean. Yeah, straight gold medal for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's this is a big moment for uh, for weightlifting around the world, and um, you know. I think it's also, it's also forcing us to really think too about like, okay, what do we care about in high performance sport? Do we really care about, um, you know, maximizing hum human performance at all costs or do we care more just about sport? 
Yeah. And I think I'm hoping that, you know, we're, we're going in the direction now where it's, we're realizing like, Hey, I actually just care about sport. Yeah. And that's definitely a thing that's going to change based on what culture of the country you're in, because that's something that definitely favors us in Canada where the culture is sport and not yeah. maximizing performance. Right. As opposed yeah. to many of the Eastern Bloc, like kind of communist countries that are like, okay, we want to juice up our lifters as a show of force. Mm -hmm. We are this great country with this great system, right? In Canada, people are just doing it independently. There's no cash prize. Yep. They just do it because they love it. And I think yeah. And yeah. And, and you know what? Like it's important to highlight the, the, the reality that international sport is as much about sport as it is about politics. Oh yeah. You know, um, I would dare say that international sports like soft combat. It's a way for nations to kind of have their like little pissing matches and no one has to die. Yeah. Um, and, and vice by the same token, um, you know, it's also a way for little nations or, or nations that maybe aren't as economically powerful to say that, Hey, we've arrived. We're legit. We're real. Yeah. Um, you know, so in Canada and in, in the United States, I think we care less about saying to the world that we're here because while the world looks to us to compare and say that, okay, now we're here, we're at your level. Yeah, we're already at the top, you know, yeah. politically. Yeah. Like, we're past caring about that. Now we just kind of, like, want to be comfortable. Yeah. Our fight's over. <laughs> yeah, so some of these other recommendations from the report, one of them was, do not permit any cash payments of anti-doping fines or sums over 500 U.S. dollars. Which, yeah. I mean, in my mind, that seems kind of like a ridiculous recommendation to even have to be made. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. No, I actually, so every Pan Ams I've ever been to, I've always been expected to pay in cash for things I did not expect to have to pay for. Um, <laughs> and every time I always had to ask for a receipt. Um, yeah, that was, I think my first, my first experience with international sport, I was actually stunned at how, uh, how, how shady that part seemed. Yeah. And did you end up getting receipts or did you have to just hound people for it? I had to hound people for them. No, like literally they're going to ask you for like US dollars in an envelope. Of course, right? And there's one example in the report of, I forget which country they were coming from, but they were going to Hungary to meet Thomas Ian, mm -hmm. And I think they had to pay a fine of $100,000. And it was too suspicious to have $100,000 cash in one car. So they split right. up over four people and they're like, okay, hey, we're going to take four different roads into this country, each with $25,000 of cash to meet this guy. And that just seems like something straight out of a spy movie where it's like, okay, we got yeah. a baby deal. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's unfortunately what it is. Um, you know, it's, I think that's what rubs me about it. Rubs me the wrong way about it so much though, is that it's like for these administrators. And I suppose this is kind of like, you know, the story of humanity, right? The people at the top are, are profiting off the backs of the people that, you know, have the most at stake, but that very much was how it felt. Yeah. Yeah, because it's like, okay, we do all this hard work to get our athletes to this competition and we go there and we pay this entry fee that's probably exorbitant and in cash and not going towards weightlifting. Yeah. 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 Which is highly unfortunate and seems kind of silly that that has to be a recommendation. Yeah. It's like, hey, just keep track of your money and don't do oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, almost, I, I will tell you that anyone that's been on Team Canada for, for a few years will, will have some story about something that seemed kind of iffy with money. Yeah, that's super unfortunate. But like, yeah. I feel like that's something that can be easily fixed with better administration and better leadership. Yeah, better administration, you know, um, and just a shift in the culture. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a shift of culture towards those, you know, Western Bloc values. Yeah. Those countries yeah. that are more for sport for sport yeah and and just really a, a general and i think i hope this is the way the world's going but like you know just a general push towards transparency yeah because i mean that's similar to everything that's going on with the protests in the states right now it's just like mm -hmm. everybody just be nice and don't be shady oh yeah like don't even start on that but <laughs> it's really just it really comes down to just you know saying i was wrong yeah or this wasn't ineffective then this is what we're going to do about it yeah yeah. Next recommendation was to limit positions on the board to four year terms and that each each person can hold a single position for two total terms. So Ian was at held some position at the IWF for, I think it was upwards of 50 years. 
Oh yeah, he's been in there since the early seventies. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and it's it's really unfortunate actually. One of um, someone I consider a real a major influence in my life as far as um, wanting to become a weightlifting coach was actually one of the victims of that. Oh yeah. Um, so Moira Lassen, um, you know, basically pulled me out of the fire when I was a brand new coach and having to organize events and things like that. Um, she was very experienced because Jeannie was already high level lifter and uh, representing Canada regularly on the world stage. Uh, Moira herself is a, was a high level referee and an executive within the IWF. Um, but yeah, I don't remember which position she was, was running for, for election, but from what I understand, she was in a position where it was likely that she was in serious contention. And I think, I believe that amongst, you know, kind of like her block of uh, voters that they believe they were going to win, but at the last minute, uh, again, bought some votes. Yeah, And it's really unfortunate because she was heading up uh, a lot of initiatives that had to do with improving conditions for women in the sport of weightlifting, um, for improving its traction in North America, making it more equitable, just being a, just generally a very positive force in the sport. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, since then, I don't think she's been involved at all, really. Um, Super unfortunate. It's too bad. So I have to wonder how many, how many great minds, how many you know, great leaders potentially were stifled by this. Yeah. And I mean, with these new regulations, it's possibly a chance for all of those great minds and leaders to actually get back into this and you know, be mm -hmm. that force of positive change. Yeah. And, and I will absolutely say, like, you know, um, this is a situation where like absolute power corrupts. Like I really think it's a great idea to have limited terms because um, as much as say, like I would like to personally be able to shape weightlifting in some way or, you know, you or whoever else, I also know that, you know, if I was in that position for long enough, I would probably eventually make mistakes. Oh, yeah. I could be, I could have the best of intentions, but simply just be out of touch with weightlifting at the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Cause if you're in, in a level there for 50 years, right. And you just keep that 1970s mentality and you don't evolve with the change. Mm -hmm you're going to be holding the sport back. And, yeah. But at the same time, it, like it can be beneficial to have that, you know, that level of consistency where it's like, okay, I've been here for 20 years, right? It's not being changed over to a new person mm -hmm. every four years. So maybe we can make some progress that way. But that's another recommendation they have is that, you know, each position is run on a four year term, but stagger the positions. So that there's an election every two years so that there's always some level of consistency where ideas are sticking around for a while. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's an organizational gap that, you know, a lot of well organization space is that, you know, what is your succession process? Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, how common is it to see some situation where, you know, um, there's a key player involved who's very effective at their job, but they never mentored anyone. And as soon as they retire, it's like the whole system falls apart. Yeah. Just because you know, someone uh, brand new comes in, they're like, okay, I have to start over from scratch now. Yeah. And you know, in many ways, organizations, I think set people up to fail that way. Yeah. Um, so yeah, some kind of succession system and, and something inbuilt where, yeah, there's multiple people working on the same idea Yeah, in that respect is important. Yeah. And even if they added in some sort of like mentor position where, okay, you get elected, but you don't start your term for a year and then yeah. you spend that year mentoring under the person who's above you. Yeah. And, and I mean, even like, I don't want to appear ageist here, but I mean, really, if you're in your eighties, what can you possibly know about a lifter in their twenties? Yeah. Like you just, you're so far removed from what their needs are and what their experiences are that I don't, I don't know how effective you can be in that capacity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where this next recommendation comes in key for me because I've seen this position in many other sports, but one of the, one of the recommendations is that a board member should be an active competitive athlete. Yes. I agree with that completely. I agree. Like there should be a competitive, like there should be an active coach, whatever. Um, but I, I think what happens here is you, you have this, like this, organizational or kind of like scope creep where then if you're all of your administrators and your key, your key stakeholders and executives are all um, chiefly concerned with the bureaucratic administration of the sport, they lose sight of, you know, well, the actual experience of it. Yeah. You know, what do people actually do? Yeah. And I mean, they're not there to run it as like a company for profit, which I mean, maybe they were up to this. Yeah. Point. They shouldn't be. But if we have like an athlete's representative there that keeps them accountable to what the true purpose of the IWF is. And that's yeah. promote weightlifting for the athlete and for the coaches that, you know, use it as a full-time job. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's a gap that should be, uh, that really just needs to be addressed because I mean, if you look at the way just business and the way people value things in general are going, it's that they, they want more tailored experiences. They want, 
experiences that can account for um, their needs, their personal experiences, and, and things that resonate more closely with them. Um, I think the days where, you know, we just accept being told from the top down uh, and we're told like, you know, you jump this high and that where you, and you're with us or against us. Like, I think those are over. Yeah. I think people aren't willing to accept that anymore. And then I think uh, my last recommendation that I had here was that there should be a proportional representation of men and women on the board that sticks to how many men and women are competing in the sport uh, internationally. Because I believe yeah. right now there's, oh, where did I have it here? I think there's about 15 people across the various positions on the board, whether that's like directly on administration mm -hmm. or uh, international federation presidents that I think one out of 15 of those is a woman. Yeah. No, that's, it's just not good. It's uh, I've, this has been a gripe of mine for is pretty much as long as I've been coaching, but I remember being just stunned at how few women coaches we actually have. Oh yeah. And not just, not just in Canada. I mean like worldwide, when I was at worlds, I think I saw three or four female coaches. Yeah. And, even and almost always exclusively working with the women's team, not, not like, you know, um, but yeah, even just as a coach, I would say that one of the things I used to struggle with was I actually can't possibly know the, the issues that female athletes face. Oh yeah. And like, you know, especially with, uh, the teenagers and the, the younger women, um, that might be more sensitive to, um, you know, certain issues, like there are things that are just inappropriate for me to ask them about or to, yeah. but they won't feel comfortable talking to me about, you know, um, you know, it, it sounds crass, but for instance, like um, the menstrual cycle, yeah, that can be a problem in training. Um, and you, you want, if you're a good coach, I think that you should be trying to create workouts that you know your athletes can accomplish the, out, the, the aims, the objectives of the workout. Yeah. And yeah. for some women, like you, you, you literally cannot, you know, continue on the same trajectory um, and have the same expectations during that point in the, in the month for them. Yeah. And it's like, it would be inappropriate for me as a coach to ask a 16 year old, hey, do I need to tone down your training because you're on your period? Like, yeah. no, you need, a, you need a female coach for that. You need, these girls need a coach that they can talk to that way. Yeah, because like as an adult male, if you go and ask like an under 18 girl about that, they're immediately going to be offended, right? And I like, I personally don't know any good strategy to go about that in a way to make a young girl feel safe. Yeah, and it's, it's largely just because we don't, we don't have any right now because of the climate we're in and precisely because we don't have more women involved in these things. Yeah, and just off the top of my head, I can't think of a single female coach in Canada. Yeah, the, 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 and that's the thing. Is it's actually, a, and that's something the CBUF is trying to address because um, it's kind of ridiculous that some of our best competitors are, are women athletes and we don't have a single woman coach that's uh, in the high performance sphere. sphere. Yeah, because yeah, outside of Bodhi, we don't have... I don't think we have any males that are internationally competitive, whereas we have like four or five internationally competitive women, but yeah. we don't have any women to coach them. So hopefully yeah. one of them, when they're done competing, would be able to take on that sort of role within the country. Yeah. And, and I think that's really important. Um, and you know what, like it'll only, it'll only help the sport, I think, because, oh, exactly. you know, um, I remember growing up as a guy, like I, I grew up in the eighties and the nineties. Um, so I grew up like in the heyday of, cheesy action films where like Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone and John claude Van Damme were like the men of the day. So growing up, like that for me, I was like, Oh, that's, I'm a male. I should be strong. Okay. Yeah. You know, so how many more weightlifting women are you going to get if, if you have that, that imagery or the, like people in those positions and you, and you legitimize it for them? Yeah. Cause I think that's something that the USA is actually doing very well right now is promoting women in the sport. Now, yeah. you know, off the top of my head, I can only think of one American women's coach, and that's Amy from Catalyst. Mm -hmm. But despite them not having a lot of female coaches, they're still doing a really good job of promoting females in the sport. Oh, yeah. And, and you're going to get like, and that's the thing is Amy's, Amy's very visible. Yeah. Um, but you'll definitely see more of them. Like uh, when, I, when I've been to, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been to many American meets, but um, the last one I was at the Vegas Open, like I saw quite a few female coaches there. Yeah, that's I think you're definitely going to see more in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely think, you know, moving forward, that's something that's going to happen more. Yep. Yeah. So I think that's all I had for the McLaren report. Yep. And we already covered how that's kind of going to affect Canada and other countries. Okay. And 
Okay, mm -hmm. moving on to our next topic then. Um, so you have a pretty good tie with Canadian weightlifting and the board, right? And so what have they been up to over these last few months of quarantine here? Because we haven't really had any competitions going on. So I assume you guys are busy working on some of this. <laughs> yeah, so you know what? Like in the last, last few months prior to, um, I, I would actually say since like Worlds in, in Pattaya, there's been a shift in that, um, you know, essentially a lot of a lot of people that ran the sport before are starting to retire they're taking more of a backseat and it's, there's a bit of a generational shift um yeah so we're kind of we're working on really reimagining the the way the sport actually works in canada because the model that we we use for competitive sport versus what businesses gyms and people are actually doing with weightlifting just they're not congruent anymore mm -hmm. so the big steps we're taking right now, or we're really looking at, okay, well, what are the needs of Canadian athletes? What are the needs of Canadian coaches and, and how do we meet those? So we're, we're at a point now where we're essentially like talking amongst ourselves thinking, okay, well, we know the following, what are the possible solutions we can deploy to fix these things? Um, we're also in talks quite closely with, with the American board, figuring out like what were their best practices? What was essentially, what was their story? How did they transform? Because a lot of our, our problems are similar. So I think we're, we're at a point now where we're basically in the, the beginning phases of, okay, we know there are problems and we have a sense of what they are, but we, before we can like really do anything about them, we need to define them carefully. So um, for instance, right now, like myself and Mac Reed, we're, we're looking at, okay, well, what is the state of high performance weightlifting Canada right now? And what are the immediate gaps we can identify? So we've had a couple of meetings now where we've talked, okay, well, these are some of the perceived gaps that we definitely know exist, but now we're looking in the, in the, we're in the stage of looking, okay, well, what are some possible solutions to address these? But, you know, as I said earlier, these are all hypotheses still. Yeah. So we're very much still in a phase where we're like, okay, well, what are the possible experiments can we build? What are the things we want to look at? And when things, you know, sort of return to normal, we can start actually uh, trying those things out and, and seeing what happens, what works. Yeah. You know, something that um, Craig Walker, our president, worked on was uh, building an alliance with USAW. And through that, that like directly through those talks, that's how the North American Open Series was uh, created. Okay. And then what's that North American Open Series and going to end up looking like, do you think? So the North American Open Series right now, it's, it's, four, it's four planned uh, American Open style competitions that Canadians will be able to participate in along with Americans. And Right now, with the way the schedule is looking, is we're looking to essentially um, travel around around the continent. So I believe, for instance, that the um, the North American Open West series or Open Series West is actually supposed to take place in Canada um, in September next year. September? Wow. Okay, that's coming yeah. up quick then. Like yeah. September now, twenty one oh, or September in like three months? September. Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, this is all very tentative, and it would be it wouldn't be this year; it'd be next year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that's the strategy. And the idea is basically how do we, how do we bridge that gap and how do we, you know, essentially almost operate like a super team. Yeah. You know, I think like one, one thing that I know that I experience regularly when I go abroad for these competitions is that, and, and I see this more amongst the younger coaches and younger athletes, but um, there's a lot of camaraderie between team USA and team Canada. Like uh, I've, I've said it many times, like when I'm not, if I don't have a Canadian athlete that I'm pushing or, or I'm rooting for, like when I'm rooting for an American athlete, yeah. because they come from the same situation as us, we're neighbors. And, and quite frankly, everyone I've met on the American team is really nice. Oh yeah. Really cool people. Yeah. Cause we're culturally very similar the way we approach sports. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and moreover, like our societies, the, the way we're organized, the way we, you know, we work, the way we live and the way we spend our free time is very much the same. Yeah. So it only makes sense that we should be sharing trading notes here. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can kind of operate as like the 51st state that is underestimated yeah. and huge. Yeah. And, and you know what? A big part of it is also logistics. So I'll give you an idea here, like um, getting all your venues equipment around the continent is actually really tough. Oh yeah. Obviously. Never mind like okay, it's all tough. things that are designed yeah. to be heavy. Yeah. So what people don't realize with the organization of competitions like this is you got to think, okay, what is the most efficient route I can take across the continental United States with my equipment? Yeah. How much is it going to cost me? 
And how do I reach the maximum number of, of athletes or people that want to participate in these events? There's a lot of logistical problems that come with this. I mean, like DHL, FedEx, UPS, like they will pay millions of dollars for research on how to route things efficiently. Right? It's, yeah. it's a huge challenge for organizations like ours to figure out how to run these things um, in a way that produces tons of value for the individual athletes and for the spectators, but is also cost effective for us. You know, it's kind of like the same problem we talked about earlier where it's like, let's see you want us to get better and then when we get better you'll give us more money yeah but how do we get better you know so it's that same challenge yeah so something that this allows the usa to do and it allows canada to do is that for us to produce a meat at that scale um in canada would be enormously expensive we just don't have the, the kind of the capital to invest to get that going yeah and you know what if we were to get that capital say it would be a huge amount of risk because we'd essentially be hedging the future canadian weightlifting on one event yeah. Whereas if there's an event that just happened in Chicago, um, you know, and there's a truck that's uh, sitting somewhere in storage that has all the venues equipment. Well, you know what, like it's just to drive through Michigan or through Michigan up to Canada, like, and it's not a problem. Yeah. So it's much more cost effective that way. So then we can get the USA weightlifting can basically help us get the equipment and the, and the, the supplies we need for the venue at a much cheaper cost. Meanwhile, the USA weightlifting gets to expand the series as well. So, mm -hmm. You know, for us, then we can piggyback off of essentially the, the promotional strength that they've already built and further promote Canadian weightlifting with them. Yeah, because I mean, like the majority of the Canadian population lives within however many kilometers of the border, right? Yeah. It's not like they're logistically far away. It's just a matter of, okay, we're technically in a different country. But yep. if we can just share the equipment and say, okay, if it's happening south of the border, we'll come there. And if it's happening north of the border, you come here and just trade off. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know what? It makes a ton of sense because you know what? There, there are Canadian athletes that have American coaches mm -hmm. and, and vice, you know, vice versa. Like I've, I've spoken with American athletes that want coaching for me. I've, uh, I've, uh, friends who have been approached by American co athletes wanting to work with Canadian coaches. So it's, I, I think as a whole, you know, the world is getting just more international anyways. Yeah. So it only makes sense. Like I, I got a Belgian athlete. Yeah. Yeah. Like in the world where I've had that before. Yeah. Right. So we're not we're not limited in terms of the thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. As coaches, we're not limited by geography anymore. Yeah. And if anything, like this whole pandemic thing is going to really push distance coaching. Oh, definitely. Because I mean, that's I know that's what I've been doing full time for the last three months is just coaching through. That. Yeah. Well, yeah. How many coaches do you know that were like, well, I didn't really want to do online before, but I guess I have to now. Yeah. All the coaches that are still coaching. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that can only increase the level of competition that's happening for Canadian athletes too. Mm -hmm. It's like we were talking about before with Europe where it's just like, okay, it's just train right away. Right. Mm -hmm. now if we have Canadians competing against Americans on a more frequent basis. That's going to just popularize the sport in Canada because it's going to give us that many more opportunities to have that closer level of competition. Absolutely. And you know what it does for Canadian weightlifting too, is it, it produces more value for the Federation so that then we can go and we can ask private companies for larger sponsorships because oh, we can yeah. give them bigger audiences. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing I've definitely noticed with weightlifting, at least in Alberta. It's like, okay, we, we're hosting a competition. How many chairs do we rent for the audience? Yeah. So hopefully we're going to have a couple hundred, but realistically we're going to have like seven. So should I really even rent chairs? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's the thing, right? Like the state of sponsorship in, in Canadian weightlifting, you know, 10 years ago was in, in largely even until now was like, Oh, you want to sponsor us? Um, go talk to what, whatever athlete you want to put on your website or whatever that you want to close and give free stuff to, and you deal with them personally. Yeah. That's not, that's not a model. Like swim Canada tells speedo. Okay. You know, you're paying us half million dollars, whatever they want. And if you want your brand recognized at all at one of our events, like we even want our athletes to be allowed to wear your, your apparel, you have to pay us a sponsorship fee. Yeah. You know, so uh, I'm not going to say that Canadian Wales is necessarily going to go in that far of a direction because we don't necessarily have the traction swimming does yet. We're not going to pull an IPF and be like, you know, you got to spend hundred grand just to license your underwear here. But we're definitely also looking at, okay, like, well, how do we actually produce a real sponsorship system? Like, how do we actually get revenue for, you know, um, Canadian weightlifting as a federation and for the athletes? Yeah. Yeah. Cause then the more revenue we can get for Canada weightlifting, the more events we can have, the more popular we can make the sport and yep. then it'll just grow from there. Exactly. And that's, and that's the most frustrating thing about business, right? Is that like to make more money, you got to have money. Yeah. Money makes money, unfortunately. Exactly. Yep. Again, chicken in the egg. It's like, well, 
We can't just have it for free. We have to prove the worth first. Right. So yeah, like it's going to be, it's going to be an uphill fight for us for the next few years. But once we get that critical mass, once we get that, that principal amount of money and we, we have enough that we can actually take some risks and, um, you know, really start pushing more. That's when you're going to see the real change in the landscape here. Yeah, man. I can't wait for that. That's going to be really exciting for all this to come together. Yeah. 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 I'm excited too. Yeah. I think one of the things Canada can kind of do in the meantime, or at least here in the West is the way we've been running uh, competitions is we'll have a session where we combine however many weight classes, right? We'll like, we'll have mm-hmm. the bottom three men's weight classes, but then it still ends up being, okay, everybody's just following themselves. So one thing they did at Ogopogo last year in Kelowna, the Vikings weightlifting club, is instead of grouping people by weight class, they're just grouping them by starting total. Yeah. Yeah, which I really like because it kind of gives the audience something more exciting to look at because you're saying, okay, whatever, this guy's 67 kilos, yeah. the other guy's 96, but they have the same weight on the board. They're, they're still going back and forth. Yeah. Like, it gives it something better to watch because you're actually looking at competition now instead of somebody just following themselves. Oh, yeah. It's far more interesting that way. I mean, uh, my father was a tennis player. And when I was younger, I used to watch tennis with him sometimes. And without fail, I much preferred watching women's tennis because it wasn't just one with a serve. Yeah. <laughs> it's an actual game to watch. Yeah, there's an actual back and forth and stuff. Just like, yeah, yeah. hit the left. Hit like, the I, I did at the time, this is in the 90s. I'm like, I don't care how hard... Uh, Andre Agassi or like Pete Sampras and swing a racket. I just don't. Yeah. I want to see some tactics. I want to see some back and forth. I want to see when you actually breathe heavy. Yeah. I mean, that's why I love following American weightlifting so much more than I love following Canadian weightlifting, which mm-hmm. is so unfortunate, but because there's lifters that you can look at there that go back and forth. Yeah. Who can you name in Canada that goes back and forth? Yeah. But you know what? Like that's the thing is that if we get more money involved and we, we make it cooler, we'll have that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be, you know, within the next five years, we'll start having something like that in Canada, which is going to be awesome. Yep. Yeah, cool. So then my last topic here was just if you had any experiences that you want to share of you working with some of Canada's top lifters, whether that be like locally or at international competition. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I will say this over and over, but what always stuns me about working with Canada's best is – the character. Oh yeah. Um, well, you know, like when I went to my first worlds, I was like, I was put in a position where I was on paper head coach of the women's team. Okay. But I was the least experienced international coach there. Yeah. Um, and I remember thinking like, okay, don't, don't screw up. Like <laughs> you've got a lot of responsibility here potentially. Um, and when I started really interacting with people and, and, you know, and like naturally people were very tepid to, to deal with me at first. Cause like, who the hell is this guy? I'm like, why am I going to coach me a world championship? Um, and I just straight up said to them, I was like, look, I'm here to do whatever you need me to do. Um, I know I'm the new guy, but I'm, I'm here to work for you. So whatever you need, ask me, I'm there. And immediately the team welcomed me, you know, opened up more. And what I found was that it's a team comprised of people who just like, they're just so gutsy. Um, I haven't met a single person on that team that like hasn't had some great personal struggle or hasn't um, had to overcome these insane odds to get to where they got to. Um, and so whenever I've, I've been on these trips and worked with these athletes, it's, it's always a pleasure because it feels like I get to interact with some of the best people on the planet. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I don't mean even just like athletic. I really mean like these are just good people. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's not surprising that they have that level of character because to go through all of that, to get that good at something that's not mm-hmm. popular or rewarding at all in this country. Like they have to have yeah. special inside. Exactly. And so you end up being like everyone that's there is you're just with a, a team of people that you know, everybody works hard. Yeah. Everybody's good. Um, and everybody cares. Yeah. And that's definitely not something that happens by accident or through some system. That's something that they have no. to go out of their way to do. No. So as a, as a coach, like it's, it's a wonderful experience because it really, like I, I, I can't go to one of these events and not work my ass off. Yeah. Um, like I will, I will go without tons of sleep. I, I will go without eating for like, I, got, I remember um, when I was in Guatemala uh, for about a week, I ate one meal a day because of busy coaching or whatever, running around and, and yeah. just didn't have time for it. But I didn't care because I was, I was there working. It was, it was just that, an amazing experience to get to work for um, these people that just care, you know? 
like, and, I, and this isn't to like, denigrate people um, because I like working with athletes of all calibers. Um, you know, when you, when you're in a gym sometimes you, or you work with uh, people that are less committed um, at times, it feels like, you know, it really is just a service. It's like, you believe that you're giving me X amount of dollars and therefore I'm obliged to give you X services. Yeah. And, that, and that's fine. You know, like, and that's, that's the way it should work for a lot of people too. But it's, I think what really changes things for me when I work abroad with these people is it, it really, that whole concept of doing something for the love of it is, yeah. is the most evident there. Yeah. Cause at that point they're not just people that are like, okay, I'm going to give you this many dollars and you're going to make me not a fat piece of shit. Right. They're like, yeah, okay, we have a yeah. partnership where we have an understanding where I'm going to work this hard. You're going to work this hard and we have a common goal. And yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like when you hear everyone's story, like, um, you're just like, for me, I was just galvanized to work. Yeah. It didn't matter. Um, so yeah. And I, I've, you know what, I've made some great relationships on those trips. Like, it's funny. We see each other maybe like three times a year. Um, but whenever I'm, the, whenever I'm one of these teams, like it, it always feels like I'm right back at home. Yeah. And I mean, that's the power of having that relationship with the athletes that are ready to work that hard. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That was a great podcast. I was happy to have you on. So I was happy to be on. Thank yeah. you. Where can everybody find you on your social medias and at your gym? So just lift Inc on Instagram. That's why, uh, or you can find us on Facebook. Um, our website is currently being retooled. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of stuff in the works that we're going to be launching in the next few months. So stay tuned. Cool. And then just what's that website? Sorry. Justlift.ca. Justlift.ca. Awesome. All right, guys. So make sure to check out Greg there because he's obviously had all this awesome experience. So hopefully you guys can learn a thing or two from him. And then if you're looking for any sort of coaching, in Ontario or even if you're in Belgium or whatever other country now because like <laughs> it's online because yeah. of COVID. Yeah. yeah. No.